Thank you, all of you, and most uh, most of all, my I can call her my co-author because we were in one book. We're going to be in another book and many other books together, and that's what a beautiful relationship and a friendship has developed by meeting. What? Not even six months ago in mm -hmm. December. So this entire thing, I love your question. Thank you, Savannah. Your question mm -hmm. was. How did we gather the women together for the book? Yes. So approximately two years ago, I was introduced to the publisher, and that's Michael Butler from uh, Beyond Publishing, and Louisa, who is our third leg, the Goldie girl <laughs> that I like to call, and she's also one of our Armenian uh, authors. And we were talking and I told Michael, I said, I want to do something that it's a book about Armenians, Armenian women writing a book to make an impact in other people's lives. And he said, what a great idea. So it was Lucine, uh, not Lucine, Louisa and I who approached him. Mm -hmm. Few months later, COVID hit, everything went down, and next thing I know, he calls and says, well, we're doing the book, it's not your book, but it's called The Immigrants. Would you like to be in the book? We would love for you to be. And as a matter of fact, in the foreword, he has dedicated and said thank you to myself and Louisa for starting this entire journey of the powerful immig female immigrants. So he's done that. And after this was published, he gathered the women together. We had nothing to do with it. But it was beautiful because I got to meet <laughs> Liana through this and many others. Uh, because of that, my journey is just starting. And I would like uh, to introduce Liana Tomekian. And I think we can sit and talk about it, introduce why this is so important to me for every single person. If you don't have a book in you, because it's not easy to have a book, having a book is great, writing it is great. And then what happens? How do you become the author? How do you promote it? What is your intention? Why are you writing it? Of course, uh, we're not Danielle Steele yet. Yet, <laughs> the word yet is an imperative. So it started as a collaboration. And I think it's very great to collaborate because you only get one chapter. And in that chapter, you get to learn how to write and go from A to Z in less in, with 3,000 words. And by telling a story in 3,000 words and making a difference, that's beautiful. So it started that way, and the stories of each immigrant, each author, when you read it, you will realize that we have uh, one of them, Dr. Emily Latron, that I had an, or another book signing with her last Sunday. She came from Vietnam in the boat when she was a little girl. And from there, how to where she is today and how she's making an impact and making a difference, you know, and to so many of them, all 24, every single one, their story is very impactful. Ours, Liana will talk about hers and we would like to read a little bit excerpt of our chapter. And thank you for coming, Mr. Chenian. <laughs> Please join us. Um, my story is uh, starting because the name of my business, the work that I do is called Heal Within. And I like to say my story is all about how the journey of healing within started. So, Leanna John, would you like to say a few words? Of course, well, first I wanna thank you because this is all new to me. I'm just following Lisa's footsteps and taking the lead. Um, this book is really incredible and I'm honored to be a part of it. It gives me the 
the chance and the opportunity to share the amazing things that we're doing in Armenia. And that is my goal to, um, you know, travel. We started from Texas and then Miami. So yeah. my goal is to get what I have in there out, what um, my life has been, what I went through the past six, seven months, what my dad passing away. Uh, and then now we have a nonprofit called Sotik's Home. And uh, the only purpose of that nonprofit is we're building, we're going to start building a shelter in Armenia after winter. And um, our goal is our, I get everything every time I talk about the, yeah. the war, but uh, our heroes passed away, uh, giving their lives to the motherland. So my friend Mary and I, our mission is to make sure their wives and children are taken care of and we want to implement the mindset of the women and business that we have here back home in Armenia. So our goal is to take care of them in the shelter, nurture them, educate them, help them further their education, and also give them a professional life that whatever it is that they want fully funded by the, the organization. So that is my goal when I have the, the book out is to travel, tour, and bring um, the shelter awareness in Armenia. That's beautiful. Thank you. Yes. Very good cause. And I truly believe all of us have a story. And when we match it up with a cause, it becomes more significant. My cause has been uh, my grandmother, who was my grand person, my ideal, my mentor, and because she was one of the survivors of the genocide that they dragged her over her mom's body when they killed mom, uh, that entire thing and her being a part of the orphanage and everything is because I started Heal with an International for the kids that is for children who are motherless. Mm -hmm. So most of the work that I do is to help women, and girls, and children. So I think that's why I was so drawn to Liana for her cause and my cause. And life is about giving and paying it forward. So Liana John, let's have a seat. Um, we can read a little bit of an excerpt. Would you like to read an excerpt? Sure. Okay. Go first. <laughs> I go first. Okay. Um, I'll, I'm all about numbers. Uh, Three is my number. Mm -hmm. Three times three is nine. <laughs> nine, which I call it the spiritual number of uh, completion and birthing. So two of the ladies here know about it. And without me knowing about it, when this book got published, I open and I am on page 54 that adds up to a nine. And I'm like, there are no coincidences in life. Um, it says, journey to heal within. I like to say we all journey in one way or another, a journey from country to country, spiritual journeys, journeys of discovery, and our journey from pain to gain. And what does immigrant mean to me? It's I am my grant and how I grant thee. The next time you are called an immigrant, remember that you must grant yourself the permission to say yes. Yes to accepting this place you call home. Yes to a new life that you choose. And yes to who enters your home, your dwelling, your space, your body, and your life. So the story of our lives tells people what we have done and the road we have traveled. But it says nothing about the fundamental essence of who we are. It fails to address the spiritual component which I have come to understand it is the most important aspect of who we are. You may not control all the events that happen to you, but you decide not to be reduced by them. And that was from Maya Angelou. So I go on talking about where I come from, where I was born in Iran, and my grandmother and her journey. And I like to start just a few it all began in 1915 
on the outskirts of the Turkish territories within the Ottoman Empire. Thousands of people were dragged out of their homes by the Turkish soldiers with guns. Knowing the rumors, the ones who could hear of the commotions in the neighborhood tried to grab whatever and whoever they could to go into hiding, trying to safeguard their children and loved ones, as they recognized the image of terror in each other's eyes. Those who missed the clues or were surprised were found by the men on horses or sorges, with guns and daggers breaking down their doors. The soldiers dragged the occupants to the streets, crying and screaming, and all the while, holding tight to their children, sisters, and mothers. One woman, holding her five-year-old daughter tightly, was dragged out of her house by her beautiful braided hair. The black braids were wrapped tightly around the soldier's large hand. Hundreds of women and children were assembled and forced to walk for weeks at a time. A walk with little water and no food for long days and only a short pause. As a child, my grandmother remembered the distraught faces of the women, the cries and many moans and groans being pulled out of line and disappearing. Years later, understanding that they were raped and hurt by the soldiers, then set back. So it is in this distance that was holding her that was pulled away. She watched in bewilderment. Her hand was still in the air as she watched her mom fall. The woman behind bent, trying to help her stand. Commotion, yelling, she felt herself being pulled away she gathered all her strength. Fleeing away, she ran to kneel beside her mother on the gravel, watching her mother fighting for her last breath. She was gently dragged over her mother's fighting for her last breath. The body, another woman who could barely walk by herself, holding her hand, she kept looking back and crying as the march continued. Years passed. But the memory of her mother's gentle touch and her eyes closing in the midst of chaos, with cries and moans, the smell of dust everywhere from the galloping of the horses and the loud voices of soldiers talking and ordering remained. Each scene, sound, assembled into a memory, welded. So, this is how the beginning was for me, listening to my grandmother talk about it. But one thing she would always instill in me was, never ever forget where you come from, but don't you ever hold hate in your heart. And that's how I grew up. I grew up not seeing color, race, gender. Everyone was in equality, and that's the household I grew up in. Years ago, and this is where this beautiful lady touched my heart. Together we created a scarf. And that scarf was her creation, her art. It was a beautiful silk scarf, but I have it still, two of them, at the office. And my quote, and the scarf was this beautiful girl in a dark, do you remember, black? She's kneeling, kneeling, kneeling in a position and this beautiful scarf wave going through, and my quote on the side that said, our eyes are not only to see, but to project what we witness. So may each day of your life that you experience things and witness things become an essence, a pebble of a memory in your life, in who you are, and realize with a twinkle of a snap of a moment, you can change that and stand up for who you are, and show up for who you are, because you do matter. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, the energy, all yours.
and this all seems like a dream actually right now because coming from uh, well my little about my past uh, I was a stay-at-home mom married for 10 years and uh, married when I was 21 had my son when I was 22 okay <laughs> so um, right after my son was about a year and a half um, I got cancer so then you know most of my 20s was doctors and hospitals and healing so early in my 30s I went through uh, the stage of being alone so I went through the divorce and again never worked in my life never had that outside experience just a stay home mom so I felt like I was blindsided and thrown into the wolves and I had no idea what you know work was business was uh, or even people because I was just around family never really knew different types of people so I want to say that anything is possible <laughs> Never have I ever imagined I would be here, even, you know, talking to a, a group of beautiful ladies and gentlemen. And uh, I am honored and pleased and thankful. I never once said, I did say why in the beginning, like why this, why me. But I am really, really, uh, I'm blessed. That's all I can say. I was given a chance of a second life, uh, something I've never done before. And I am, I'm blessed. That's all. That's all I could say. And this book, uh, my favorite part again is just talking about the when you think, okay, I'm, I think I'm strong now, and then you go, you hit the ground, and you're like, okay, I tried this, I'm like this, I'm done. There's nothing else. And then when my dad got sick, the the last few days in the hospital, he told me, he's like, you are exactly like me because he worked until like the last days. So he said, you're exactly like, make sure you do not stay home, you're not bored, or else you'll get sick. I was like, okay. <laughs> so I got back up, I'm like, I can't stay home. Not anymore. I promised myself not to do that anymore. So, um, but and then I thought I'm strong. And then when I went to Armenia and I met like a lot of wonderful women that just recently lost their husbands. You know, just one day they're gone, and now they they're forced into the life that they never experienced. And I'm like, I know what you mean. I know how you feel. It can't. It won't be the same. You know, you lost your husbands, but I kind of have an idea, and so we have to to make sure that we lift them up. And that's what I wish I had around me, someone that could tell me. I know what you're going through, I'm going to help you like get up there, I, I'm going to tell you like a little secret here and there. So um, everything is a lesson and I'm really, really glad I went through it. And my goal is to help them, give them a little bit of the, the tips, you know, if they could detour some of the problems, why not? <laughs> so that that's my goal and my favorite part in the book. There you go. Thank you. <laughs> we thank you. So what page are you in? 180. 180. Okay. That's nice. Hi, Lucy. Also. I've already yeah. thanked you. <laughs> Thank you for I'm being so here. here. Thank you. Yeah. So I'm wearing a mask. It's uh, okay. My daughter goes to school and all good. A lot of flu. No wine for you. Going, so I just in case. Mask. It is Thank you. Really <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> so is there any questions? Uh, we're open book. <laughs> Duh. We're an open book. We both enjoy talking, and if there was anything that we can share, we can talk. By all means, yes. So congratulations on this book. Is this the first of many series? Is this a series? Well, actually, this I don't know, but we are starting a new series, uh, okay. which is going to be, uh, I'm the person, the lead, uh, and it's called The Power of She. It's going to be The Power of She 1. Uh, which is going to be 33 Armenian women. Three times three is a nine, and that's how we complete it. So 33 Armenian women who have overcome extreme challenges or a part of their life story or something that where they are today, they are making a difference and impacting 
either with a cause or something, impacting others um, to this day. Mm -hmm. So those are the ones. As a matter of fact, we have all the paperwork, the application and everything. We are looking for the top notch, the cream of the crop of our industry, of our Armenian women to be a part of this because I think it is it is a promise I can say maybe to my grandmother or whatever, but it is a promise that I want this cycle of giving and making an impact in the lives of the new generation that is coming forward for us to be their voice. That's what it is. So may the power of she continue and that's going to be a trilogy the first one is all armenians the second one is going to be middle eastern women and the third we may open it for <laughs> hello welcome so thank you for being here ready. don't all good hello Hi. how are you absolutely wonderful <laughs> you come with bouquets of roses <laughs> Smart girl. Beautiful. So, and you are? Me? I am Noreen. You remember me? Of course I do. Yes. I'm just saying that so everybody else can meet Noreen. Yes, I am Noreen. <laughs> nice seeing you guys here. Sorry I was late because of my job. Always late. So, I'm uh, glad to be here. Thank you uh, for coming. I look forward to obtain one of your books. Yes. And then looking forward to your new project. Yes, the power of she. Yes. Um, we're gonna do yeah. So we did a little bit of a talk about our book. Thank you for coming, Mr. Chanier. It's always a pleasure seeing you, sir. <laughs> for our new ladies, or I don't know if you want wine. Would you care for some, some wine? wine? Sure. It's an Armenian wine. Here. <laughs> I have a question for Liana. Uh, so, how do you want community involvement in your um, nonprofit project? Because I feel like, you know, would you need it? Because I'd like to be a part of it somehow, of course. contribute somehow to it. Yeah. Uh, we just came back from Armenia. We, we made the announcement while we were in Armenia about the nonprofit and the shelter. So um, we were just trying to kind of let the jet lag pass. So we're going to do a live and we're going to notify everyone the details okay. of what it is exactly because we just mentioned the shelter and the nonprofit, but we didn't go into details. So we will do a live and um, we're going to, from A to Z, and then uh, details will be provided and we will answer all the questions and anyone that wants to come on the live and also, you know, give their thoughts, opinions and ideas, more than welcome. We're also going to be open to um, accepting board members as well, but not just anybody. It has to be like powerful women or someone that's in it for the right reasons, not yeah. just to be in it. But yes, definitely we do want um, support from our community as well. So we will announce once that the light is ready. Do you travel to our community? Um, I haven't traveled recently, but yeah, if I need to travel, I'll travel. Mm -hmm. Great. Hopefully next year when it's the opening. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm sure we could do things from here in the meantime. Yeah, definitely. Uh, All right. I have a question mm -hmm. about your shelter. Mm -hmm. Is your shelter going to also help women who have been abused? That is um, what we had initially decided on. But first, we want to help out the women who lost their husbands. Right. And right. then um, we tried to do that, but we had a lot of meetings in Armenia, and it was a little bit more complicated. Is it because there's already a shelter there? Um, there is help, yeah. but also um, if we take on women like that, we have to make sure security is top right. notch. Exactly. And we have to make sure the other residents that are staying there 
are safe. Yeah. So that's, um, I mean, regardless, we're going to have 24-hour security at the shelter. That's good. But when it's women like that, you have to have like, the cops involved over yeah. there as well on standby, just in case. It's a lot of rules and regulations we have to go through. So in the beginning, we're only going to be helping the, the women and the children. The there. culture is taboo, though. So mm -hmm. uh, abused women yeah. over there is not necessarily an abused woman. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. The wife. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Exactly. And so like choice. she's leaving means like she's tearing apart the whole family, right? right? And so there's a reputation to be held, you know. Mm -hmm. Right. Can't exactly. Make it look like she exactly. might not even get any support from her own family. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I, yeah. I gave a, a talk at one point at a uh, shelter mm -hmm. for abused women, and um, it was really amazing. I was like, you know, that happened to me, and all of a sudden, all eyes were on me. And how did you survive? Yeah, mm -hmm. it's yeah, it's tough. It's it's it tough, is. and it's always nice to know that there are people who are who want to help other mm -hmm. women, no matter what their situation is. Mm -hmm. Of course. There aren't, I guess, that many uh, in Armenia, no, that, that many organizations that help with abused women. I know AOI is helping them. I, I only know AOI. Yeah. 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 But it's hard, just like um, you know, you say, you know, it's hard because they don't come out. Mm -hmm. They don't really talk about those problems. Yeah. Um, as a DV consultant, I must say, even here, um, when a woman is abused, they go in and out. Uh, yeah. They leave home and they go back. They leave and they go back at least seven times. Mm -hmm. uh, the fear factor uh, or the power of the other person as a, the person that they are being victimized by, and it doesn't matter who it is, um, the fear factor of hurting a family member or a child is far greater than their own life. So that's why they cave in and they go back home. So mm -hmm. that's one of the things we have, the YMCA, I mean the YWCA, not the M, YWCA that has shelters and everything here. But we also have many other organizations and one of the biggest things that I always wanted to do is create what we call, um, my dream has been creating a, uh, a shelter for the women in golden cages. And I call it the women in golden cages because women who are affluent and career women also go through DV situations and that's where they don't dare because their stigma, there is a stigma of if you've got the money, you've got the career, how is this ever possible for you to be in a situation like this? You're supposed to know better. And that's not always the case. So I call it the women in golden cages that they live in multi-million dollar homes. Mm -hmm. I had a client who, um, as an attorney, uh, she had a security uh, under her car. She had to have a security uh, a beep, uh, that was being monitored by her husband in her purse. And that entire time, no matter where she is, in the office, in a deposition, he had to have a way to hear her at all times. Mm -hmm. If not, uh, the things that she went through, she caved in and said, you can hear anything. The entire thing was a jealousy factor. Mm -hmm. And in our culture, that is the worst because it was, you do anything wrong, not only the children, I don't care your sister, your brother, your in-laws, nothing matters. And because of his status and power, that's where it all happened. So, until it got real bad. Yeah. So, well, did she get, did she get away? It's not she got away, she is safe. That's, it's not getting away, that's it is good. being safe. So do you think there is a choice? There is a choice. In what way? Why to stay or to just leave? Everything is a choice. It's a fear. Everything is a choice in life. Okay. Yeah, but the fear somehow uh, 
the fear factor fear is factor the controls the, fear the choice. The fear or the comfort. Because sometimes they What matters to you? Your luxury, what you're used to, because the golden cage of women will not go to a shelter. Yeah. Not a regular shelter. That's not what they're used to. It's like a change of lifestyle. They can't, the children cannot handle it. They cannot, mm -hmm. that is, yeah. that is not what they're used to for, for however many years. And knowing that it's my life or my lifestyle, which one is more important? That's where it came down to, after four tries. Four times, she left, she came back. So after that, she realized life was more important because when their hurt got to the mother, that was not acceptable anymore. So when you go into hiding, you go into hiding, nobody knows where you are. And that's why most people most women cave in because they want to come because the family is going crazy, not knowing where you are. Hello. Hello. How are you, Jeffrey? Very good. good Thank to see you. you for coming. Can <laughs> you get awesome. anyone wine? Red, white? No, thank you. No? <laughs> so that's why um, I think there are so many people in life that want to help. It's just, uh, we just need to be more daring and stand up for those who don't have a voice. As you said, we have to tell our stories, so... That's it. Know that they are not lonely, especially That's women. It. My journey of healing as an assistant from, a t being an assistant to attorney, I got to what I am doing is because I healed uh, my pain, my physical pain, which was emotional and mental pain, through hypnotherapy and it just changed the course of my life and I like to call it from masculine mm -hmm. to the feminine helping. Mm -hmm. That's a really interesting way to put it. Yeah, that's all. That's all. That's all. <laughs> 22 years and now we're helping others journey to heal with it. Yeah. And also I want to piggyback on uh, what you were saying about the choice. You do have a choice because I went through that. And um, I had the choice of either staying and enjoying the luxury life, but not having a say or anything, or I get out and I start from zero, <laughs> starting zero from, from everything. Bias. Yeah, it, mm -hmm. it comes to the point where once you realize you're a guest in your own home, mm -hmm. it's time to leave. Mm -hmm. so. And look at where you are now. Easy. <laughs> you're soaring, girl. Yeah, not easy, but worth it. Definitely worth it. That's another fear factor, the unknown. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. The unknown is the most fearful thing, is because we don't know the steps that we are taking, where we're going, what will yeah. happen. The question you might know the answer, why do they say usually, no matter how unhealthy the marriage or relationship is, most of the time women are the one who pull the plug. Men don't, and then they get surprised why is she asking for a divorce. Have you heard of that? Like I, I read, I keep reading that it says usually women are the one who take the first step. Why? Why is that? Do you want to go for that? I can answer it, but I mean, if, if they're answer. both unhappy, why is it that the women, the men, won't take that step? Accountability. It also has to do with um, men think uh, it could also be that what they're doing is acceptable. It's also a little bit of a culture thing. But for them, it might be acceptable and normal. But for a woman that goes to it, it's not. What you said was very poignant of uh, being a guest in your own home. Uh, I think when we are not valued for who we are. It gets to a point that when you think you're a part of the furniture, they're already, it's like, this is not the life I chose. And I want something better. Uh, most probably, I don't know, I can't speak for all men. Of course, we're gonna be doing a book signing. 
so we can sign. Can you later to sign? Thank of you. course you can give it to me I, later. I, I, and I, I'll I, sign. I was late, I apologize. <laughs> I kind of want to catch up what you're really talking about. So, I don't know, maybe a man can answer that. But as a woman, I took the step. My husband uh, told me, literally told me, uh, I don't think you have the guts. Two days later, I was packing them. Well, I'm sorry, I heard most of yeah, the Yeah, I mean, uh, you don't dare me. As if like a poker, you're just bluffing. They don't take it seriously. Until it happens, then they're like, oh, seriously? Like, they don't really realize that it's happening or you're serious. I, I see that happening a lot. Are because we women will endure more, and men can men can go out and come back in, and culturally we are it's it's acceptable, and I think that's only my opinion. Uh, it's not acceptable when it's no. I mean, there is a line. I think I believe there's everything has its limitations, either at work or in a relationship or with your children. One point that at that very okay, moment, you so never good. know when that switch goes off in you. That's it. Because women are the, they take the brunt of everything. You have to cook, you have to clean, you have to take care mm -hmm. of the child, you have to take care of the husband. You, when they come home, you have to be the wife, and then you have to be the chauffeur. You have to be everything. And there's only so much you can handle. After you a while, you say, okay, what about me? And that's what my book is all about. That's why my life and the work that I do is you matter. Some women come, and they didn't even know they matter. When I say, what do you want? It's like, I don't know. And they don't know what they want. They don't know what they want, yeah, but we all exactly know what we don't want. <laughs> we don't know what we want. And once we know what we want, we know what to do. Once we know what we want, we know what we want. Yes. <laughs> Forge ahead. That's right. So, any other questions? Yeah, that was a great question. Half of our guest missed the front. The, the really introduction. introduction. Yeah, yeah. introduction. Yes. So I don't know if you want to do Is it seven o'clock? Maybe go back a little bit, so at least they... Well, what I can say is this book, The Powerful Female Immigrants, uh, started by a thought I had that I uh, approached the publisher and I told them I want to gather Armenians, Armenian women together to tell their stories and make an impact in the lives of others. And uh, COVID hit and he came up with powerful female immigrants. And in the beginning, he even says, thank you to Lisa, acknowledging that I started this entire journey. Um, but I like to say, it doesn't matter who starts it. It doesn't matter in your life who is ahead in line. Because when you are a part of, when you are a team, if we're all in it together, unity is more powerful than one person. So I like to call it, I could have done this book signing by myself. My dear friend would have said yes, but to me it's like the power of togetherness, of who we are. And Liana, I truly, she's amazing. And I said, let's do this together. And she said, let's do it. So that's what unity is. The book that I'm starting is all about coming together and saying yes to one another. Because that's how a tribe, we become a tribe. We become a tribe that not only I, it's an I, but it's a we, it's a they, and together we build stronger our, what do we call it, stability, is togetherness when we hold hands. The noise is louder together. Always. When look what's happening. Women, life, freedom. And that's the whole thing in, in our country, the country that I was born, I believe you were born, and yeah, was Annette born. was born. I'm a revolutionary. The, it, of, exactly. You were a revolutionary lady. In what country is it? Iran. Iran. 
We were born in Iran, and what is happening in our country at this moment mm -hmm. gives me goosebumps mm -hmm. every time. It's because 40 years of taking it frustration. Away. Frustration, and it's coming out finally. Frustration. During the time that we were there, it was during the Shah. So it was living yeah. like Europe. Après Paris, everybody was just living the life. And then suddenly, the suppression that the women are going through throughout the years with the mullahs and it's like truly an atrocity and for a woman to stand up and another woman and another one and now all men and two of our counties the biggest counties in close to Tehran which is the capital the police are standing with the people not with the mullahs mm -hmm. and that thing is far greater than any movement. It's bigger than Me Too. Me Too is nothing compared to what is happening globally because every single woman, not only Iranians, Armenians, every, everywhere is saying, I'm standing up with you. And that's called the power of sheep. Wow. wow. <laughs> <laughs> right? Exactly. exactly. Me Too is a propaganda cannot be compared to anything that's happening in Iran right now. I'm sorry, I, I had to say that out loud. Just <laughs> It was. Yeah, it is though. It is. Because where are they right now? Where are they anytime when actually... It's, they're needed. They're needed. Or their voice you know, is needed. No, I personally as a woman don't appreciate, uh, don't want to free the nipple per se. I don't uh, follow that kind of feminist ideology because I think it's all propaganda uh, to to deteriorate the woman, mm -hmm. you know, uh, to objectify as a matter of fact. Exactly. And so, women of Iran, they're so powerful right now because they're facing death. It, they are dying. Yes. So many have died. And it's devastating. It is. It's really dangerous out there to stand up and talk and, yeah. you know, to just prove that you are right and you have a right of living and enjoying the life. And here it's not that Yes. So each one of you are powerful. <laughs> each one of you have overcome your own challenges. And it doesn't matter if it's you, me, or my story better than, because I was talking to someone and she said, my story is nothing compared to that person. But how do you know the person who picks up doesn't want to hear about engineering and how you became an engineer? Because to them it's like, this is unheard of a woman from another country saying, a woman engineer? I didn't know they can. So you become an inspiration to one girl. That's already enough. Right? Mm -hmm. And that's what I say when I, the work that we do, you beautifying someone, putting their clothes on, the way she talks about how it is draped on you, how you put a scarf on, the designs that she creates, is not only I look beautiful, but what it represents for me, how I put it on, how does it look on me. So it can be from a blouse or a scarf or a book. It's how we touch somebody else's life. The stories, stories touch. Anything that comes with a story, people remember and see it differently. I mean, for me personally, I grew up in revolution time. I went to Iran during the toughest time, loving fashion, seeing my father's factory burning down during the revolution because men were not allowed to wear suit, uh, suits and ties. So I saw all of that. And then when I went to fashion school, uh, here I'm thinking about fashion, nice clothing, showing off the body. My project was to design headscarves, and I hated it. I'm like, I came to fashion school to design head scarves. But guess what? One thing that I really hated it, that built my business now. Yes. Seven years ago, I got the title of the scarf lady. Yeah. <laughs> Small world, right? Yeah, lovely scarves. Yes. So one thing I hated it, made my career now. So you never know. Life, I got me out this life works in very ironic ways. Yes. So God was oh, probably telling me, don't yeah. get scarf that much. Right? No, no, that's not That's gonna, you know, that will become your life or your future. You just don't scarf <laughs> for the rest of your life. 
something you were running from actually caught up to you and you managed to turn it around in your favor, so. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's what manifests. I added stories. It's, it's, it's your, it's I your. added stories to my scarves. And, and it, that made yeah, exactly. me the scarf lady. And it's all your fault, you know. You, you've got to understand scarves. Too well. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and that's what they say. Once you understand something very well, you start loving it. Yes. But what is a scarf, man? I like to call it a scarf. Is we go back into tradition. It starts with uh, covering. putting the covering oh, yeah. of our head when we go to church, which is called um, honoring. Mm. You know, it's purity. That's why we have the veil, and that's what veils are all about. I am pure yeah. until you lift it off, and then I devote myself and I give unto you. See how far back we go. And that's what veils are, and all kinds of a, a veil of a woman, either as physically when she becomes a woman, or the lifting of the purity of the woman when she stands there and the father hands it to the husband and says, okay, now I give you my pure daughter onto you to become a wife. So when we're talking about scarves and veils, it's deeply rooted. And I think even back then, uh, from my research, I found out brides didn't even wear white. Uh, my own great grandma got married in a red dress uh, <laughs> with a red scarf. Wow. A red scarf it's was Indian covered. Indian relations. Indian. Armenians. Indians, yeah. Armenians in Iran, probably. Oh. Like, so it was uh, maybe influenced by Persian culture. I don't mm -hmm. know. Yeah, maybe she had all the coins. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The yeah, Armenian yeah. coins, like the head, yeah. head piece. Yeah. But yeah. she had the red scarf on her head. Yeah. yeah. I mean, our traditional so garb is not all white anyway. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. So that's how she got married. So I do have a painting given says Armenian bride, and it's all red yeah. with gold. Beautiful. So it's interesting how things change. Yeah, but um, evolution. Yeah. It is. So I this is an off white. I person. love this conversation. Me too. <laughs> 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 so we have, have plenty more questions for us. We have plenty four <laughs> wonderful stories here that you yes, never know yes. what you're gonna. Perfect. Each chapter, how it's gonna be. It's gonna surprise everyone, I guess, right? You yes. better read every one. Yes, Jeffrey. Well, it's just in my mother's generation, in the 1940s and 50s here in the United States, uh, head coverings for women were much more common. The meaning was completely different, mm -hmm. and, and it was more fashion and mystery. It wasn't something that was imposed. Mm. Right. Like hats, you mean? No, no, scarves. Had, no but, also, hats but also scarves and, and other hats were certainly very popular. Yeah. Yeah. Um, That's right, 50s fashion. Even up into the 60s, like with, with yeah. Jackie O. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. That's really yeah, good but, they have, but they have a type of a scarf or head covering. It was, it was very, yeah. it was, yeah. it was very, very chic. Yeah. But, yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Audrey Hepburn has a lot of photos like that. Mm -hmm. Audrey Hepburn. Audrey Hepburn, yeah. Mm -hmm. So maybe wearing head head scarves is not that bad. <laughs> it's not. But, but it's, yeah, it's not the tradition. Why are we fighting in that? Thing? Actually, in life, nothing is bad. It's mm. how we interpret what is bad, yeah. the meaning you put to it, yes. or somebody puts on it, or yes. else there just is no good, there is no bad. It just is. Just because it was uh, imposed, yes. that's why it is yeah. bad. Somebody but said it's bad. You choose to do it. That's okay. Yeah. 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 That's the key I know one thing, I don't know anything anymore, <laughs> seriously. That's the way to go. <laughs> the best. Quick question. Actually, you sleep it beautifully. Thank you. Because I love hearing about the history and the, and the tradition. You know, where It gives more, so much more context to what's happening today. Yeah, that's right. Yes. And, and the difference between being able to type something on a keyboard to make a statement as opposed to actually taking a real risk. Mm -hmm. Well, when I grew up in Iran, we we never had the uh, we didn't have to put the chador on, but the Muslim women that we know, uh, the women who worked at our house, they would come in with the hijab and then she would put it together, put it aside before she walked into our house. I don't know because we were Christian, she was Muslim, but she would not come in with the chador. She would put it on the side, but she would put a headscarf on and then do the work and everything. So when and the does that mean, though? 
Pardon me? What does that mean? Is she respecting the Christian family tradition she, or is she... I guess my mom had told her, you know, you don't need to come with that. You are free to be who you are in here. Right. Yeah. So, can so she, she felt that she didn't have to put that because I'm usually it's her husband, husband and everything. So family. it implies then even then women did not like to cover up like that? I don't think anyone likes to be told what to do. I don't know. That's what it was. Because I use plenty of scarf now, but the fact back then that we had to cover, yeah. I, I have hated heard it. a lot of interviews on YouTube mm. where Iranian women actually do like, and they say, no, we, we, we like this. We no, those this. are the religious ones because that's how they were raised. I guess. Maybe. Not the majority, I, because it comes with the, not the culture. Okay, okay. Yeah. It's not a cultural majority. thing. Yeah, yeah. It's, a it's an honor system. It is an honor system. Yeah. Oh, well, and not honor, respect. Okay. Okay. Honor is different than respect. It's yeah. respecting the religion, respecting the husband, respecting the family, respecting the home. Her home. Despite your needs and wants. <laughs> Despite, yeah, I was going to say, what about <laughs> respecting <laughs> yourself or needs? And how about it that's, does not that's offer all needs and wants, so but it's not cross the boundary. Yes. That's it. I mean, yeah, we're not saying that they have to dress a certain way. People have to dress a certain way because then we'd be, we'd be imposing Who ourselves are we to say upon to them. them, right. Yes. Or we do say what you were supposed to do or not to do. And it become, with it, what we're raised with is normal mm -hmm. until we're exposed to alternatives. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. If, you're, amazing if, what if you're become, raised in a conservative normal. home, yeah. exactly. you either become a conservative or you have the tantrum and say, I'm going against it. So it all depends to the person, I think. Yeah, the bottom line. We are all each individuals of our own. Mm -hmm. As long as you're not. Or at least we hope to be, right? But bottom line, we're still powerful. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Together we are. Choose wisely. Yes. Choose wisely. Every choice is an experience. Mm -hmm. That's why I say there is no good, there is no bad. What do you want? Go after what you want. I agree. And that's how you grow. Yes. I grew up by doing exactly what I was told. Majority of us, all of us. That's it. Right. That's it. Until you get to the point that, okay, now. What about me? Sorry. Hold on. <laughs> this wasn't supposed to be that way. Well, you come to doubt your wants and needs because we are so conditioned. And I have asked my dearest friend to be a part of it. Uh, she's gone through in, incredible stuff, and it would be an honor to have on it. Yeah, let's do it. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And because I, uh, you know, I don't know. I don't know. Well, will we'll, we'll, it? You'll get help. Yeah. Oh, she you knows everything. Are you kidding? Absolutely. This lady's a spearhead. She's she's accomplished more than. You see, that's one of when you said. Like people will say, who wants to hear my story? I'm like, who wants to hear my story? I do. It's me too. All of us in this room. Is it now or no? <laughs> there you go. See, you already have 10 people who want to hear your story. <laughs> and that's the power of she. <laughs> she knows everything about it. I know it. about it, yes. Yes. So, by all means, if you know of anyone, we're going for a high caliber. It's not just because I want to share a story and why not? It's who you are and what kind of a difference are you making, not only in your life, mm -hmm. but making an impact in a bigger level. Mm -hmm. That's who. We're going after scholars, a possible Nobel Prize winner, and that's the caliber of the authors who may be part of our book. Okay. Yes. Lauren, are you ready? <laughs> You're making a difference too. Yes. I'm, I'm every really week. not a Nobel Prize winner yet. Yet. <laughs> yes. I like it yet. But who yes. knows, right? On the Good. Way. All right. So, shall we do a book signing? Yes. Let me get your hand. Shall we begin? I'll put the wine away. <laughs>